Okay. Um, welcome, uh, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining from around the world, um, to our virtual open day uh, for the NSE Biochemical Engineering. Uh, my name is Alex Kiparisidis, and I'm the uh, program director for the NSE Biochemical Engineering at UCL. Uh, so, uh, just briefly, our, we're going to spend a couple of minutes trying to introduce biochemical engineering, what is, what are the basic principles, what's the basic idea of biochemical engineering. We'll speak uh, quite a bit about UCL, the facilities here in the department, uh, and then we'll go on uh, and speak about the structure of the MSc uh, itself, and, and then we'll open up the floor for any questions you may have. Uh, so, for those not familiar with biochemical engineering, it can, it can sound a bit exotic, it can be uh, a bit of a of a challenge to get people to understand exactly what it is that we do. So, you know, my friends could think that I'm, I'm, I'm genetically modifying animals glow in the dark. My mom might think that I'm uh, risking my life every day with dangerous uh, substances in the lab. Uh, society, the general public, tends to associate us with a, one of the primary products of, of biochemical biotechnology, bioprocessing, which is drugs and pharmaceutics. Uh, we like to think that we're saving the world with our research. What we really do is, is a bunch of experiments in the lab and, and a lot of engineering calculations uh, and we'll see exactly what we do in, in, in just a second. So essentially what biochemical engineers do, they try to apply the principles of biology, chemistry and engineering in order to produce useful products uh, making use of cells or their components. Okay, uh, So I find it uh, useful at this stage to try and draw an analogies between biochemical engineering uh, and other better known or more popular, let's say, engineering disciplines in order to try um, and, you know, as a first pass approach to making people understand what is biochemical engineering. So uh, every engineering discipline uh, is based on a need. Uh, so it's trying to address one of the fundamental needs we have as a society. Uh, so can anyone understand what the need depicted in this picture we have on the slide might be? Uh, in case it's not clear on your screens, this is a picture of a hut. So if you could type in the chat box, let me bring it up as well. Correct, yeah. So in a way, is the need, uh, yeah, if we want to generalize a bit, it's the need for shelter. Right? We, we, need, we want to have a, a, a roof over our heads to keep warm in the winter, protect us from the elements and so on. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, we go through a design stage where essentially we're saying, where do I want the walls to be? Do I want any windows? Do I want any doors? You know, it will be one floor, two floors and so on. We go through the manufacturing stage where we actually construct the, pro the, pro the product that we have designed. Uh, and then we have the end result. So this first sort of set of pictures um, refers to civil engineering, yeah, so construction, essentially. Similarly, we have the second set of uh, pictures on the second row where uh, the need is obviously transportation. We need to go from place A to place B. Again, we have a design phase. Uh, we have a manufacturing component at a much smaller scale than the previous example. And then we have the end product with some, for, uh, some form of transportation, be it a car, a ship, or a plane. And this second row uh, refers to mechanical engineering. Okay. So uh, going on to the third row, uh, can anyone type in what the need depicted here might be? Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, got two correct answers. Uh, so, unfortunately, we get sick and we need to have uh, to take medicine in order to heal ourselves and, and go back to normal. Uh, again, there is a design stage, uh, and this is where biochemical, one of the main uh, differences or unique elements of biochemical engineering, uh, also shared with chemical engineering as well, is in that our design stage needs to take into account dynamic processes. By that, I mean processes that change over time. So if you think about brick or, you know, 
a wheel or an axle or a piston, its shape and mechanical properties will not change over time, over a considerable length of time. Yeah? Uh, whereas when we are uh, fermenting cells, for example, we have cells in culture uh, that are producing a particular protein of interest, uh, the amount of both cells and the entire environment of my reactor on day one will be dramatically different from the environment in day two. I'll have more cells, some of my media will have been consumed, some of my product will have been formed. So it's a very dynamic environment. Everything changes over time. So our design needs to be able to take uh, this dynamic nature of, the, of our manufacturing process essentially into account. The materials that we start with, um, their properties change through chemical reactions, new materials are formed, some materials um, uh, essentially vanish or are consumed in the process. Uh, we have a manufacturing step as well. It's usually, again, a bit smaller. Uh, and the final product for this particular example we're discussing uh, comes in the form of some uh, medicine. It could be pills, it could be an injectable vaccine, or, or any other form uh, that pharmaceuticals come in. Uh, so, what are some of the global challenges that biochemical engineers have contributed to and are actively working on? So, uh, past, I'd say, maybe 10, 15 years, we've seen an increase in the number of epidemics and pandemics that break out a couple of years, essentially. Uh, and when, whenever that happens, uh, the pharmaceutical companies and the World Health Organization need to respond by producing a large quantity of a particular drug or a particular vaccine in a very short period of time. So for a drug that already exists or for a vaccine that already exists, ramping up production from the day the decision is made could mean uh, a period of a minimum of six months to uh, a year. But obviously when you have a pandemic or an epidemic in your hands, you need to be able to ramp up much more uh, quickly, much more rapidly. So one of the areas where biochemical engineers have contributed is the development of uh, single-use uh, equipment. So essentially we have these single-use reactors that you can see in the picture on the bottom right of your screens, um, which replace uh, essentially the old huge stainless steel reactors uh, that are very costly to build but also take a lot of time. You need a building, an appropriate building, an appropriate infrastructure to support uh, say a two or four or five thousand liter tank. Whereas with these single-use reactors, uh, they essentially you can have them on trays with wheels underneath uh, and it's easier to ramp up your production they are in a very, very simplified way, uh, deluxe plastic bags with all appropriate, obviously, instrumentation and so on. Uh, but it's, usually, uh, it's essentially much uh, easier to ramp up your production by, uh, you know, expanding through single-use technologies. Uh, another area that uh, I think by chemical engineers are constantly involved with uh, is to make affordable medicine. Uh, so, uh, the average timeline from the time we discover uh, a new pharmaceutical substance in the lab to the time it hits the shelves and is available to patients is roughly 10 to 12 years. Uh, not only that, but also uh, the numbers, uh, the percentage of uh, molecules that go all the way from lab to the shelf is probably less than 10%. So you have a period of 10 to 12 years where the drug is available but it's not accessible to patients. And not only that, you have the cost of all the failed molecules um, that will never make it to market because they fail clin uh, clinical trials or they don't get regulatory approval and so on. And all of that cost, all of that wasted money gets baked into the few successful products. Um, so essentially, one of the main aims is how can we reduce this timeline from 10 to 12 years to let's say bring it down to six or eight years, and that would mean uh, a massive reduction in cost, and that would translate to cheaper and affordable medicine for everyone. Uh, so some of the products uh, associated with these two challenges we've been discussing are vaccine, antibodies, and recently cell and gene therapies. Uh, and those are all sort of areas that biochemical engineers are involved with. Now, obviously, we all know about climate change and the need to reduce CO2 emissions and the fact that we need to start finding alternate forms of energy and uh, reducing our reliance on, on petrochemicals. Um, 
so uh, biochemical engineers are involved in multiple ways. I'd say the primary example is the development of the biorefinery concept. So essentially, we build up biomass, uh, but we can convert part of it into biofuels that are uh, considered carbon neutral. Uh, so they don't contribute any more or less to the CO2 being omitted in the environment. Um, but also uh, utilizing every single component of, of that biomass. So instead of just taking the part that we can convert to biofuel and throwing everything else away, we try to see what other viable uh, substances we can make out of the remainder of, uh, of the biomass. Uh, and finally, um, another area uh, that biochemical engineers are involved with is in the development of environmentally friendly processes or processes that protect and, and help the environment. So. Uh, in particular, the example, the two pictures shown here, is a contaminated body of water. Uh, and after a carefully selected and genetically engineered strain was introduced to this particular body of water, it essentially ate up the contamination uh, and led to um, uh, cleaning up of, uh, of the lake uh, shown here. Uh, so the products associated you know, around these challenges are biofuels, which I guess the most popular. Uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of uh, substances that end up in cosmetics, so uh, things that not also not only cosmetics, but maybe some people will refer to as nutraceuticals. You have your omega threes, your fatty acids, and, and, and so on, carotenoids, and so on, uh, and also by remediation, which is essentially the use of um, cells uh, to um, destroy um, pollutants, essentially. Uh, so, we've discussed the areas or the general context in, in, in which biochemical engineers are involved, but what is it do, that they actually do? So, we, we already talked about how the rough timeline from discovery of a molecule all the way to uh, the shelf is roughly 10 to 12 years, but what is it that biochemical engineers do during that time? So, in this sort of qualitative graph, I have on the x-axis the scale at which we're working in. Um, that means how big is the equipment or the material that we're working with. And on the y-axis, I'll, I'll go through various steps of, of what we have to do. So let's say uh, we, we're working with genetically uh, modified cells. So we're culturing them in the lab in Petri dishes. Hopefully you're familiar with the concept of a Petri dish. If you're not, it's essentially um, uh, this little dish that I'm shown in the picture here. Uh, and that has a volume of maybe one milliliter, maybe two milliliters max, okay? Uh, so let's say we've identified that this particular type of cell produces a very valuable protein that can be used to cure a particular disease. Uh, now, the global demand for this particular protein might require us to have culture in the scale of maybe 10,000 liters per year. Uh, obviously, you we can't do that in petri dishes. So the biochemical engineers need to come in and identify how they can replicate the conditions that uh, the discovery happened in. So how can they replicate the conditions that the cells were growing in in this petri dish and see how they can translate them into equivalent pieces of equipment that are able to be scaled at the appropriate industrial size. Uh, so usually what will happen is we would go through an interim, uh, interim phase where we go maybe from a couple of milliliters to say half a liter or a liter, and that's what we call a lab or pilot scale, before finally scaling up all the way to industrial scale, which would be anywhere from 2,000 to 15, 20,000 liters um, in, in size. Uh, so essentially the biochemical engineers need to design uh, a 20,000 liter, um, let's say, or a 10,000 liter uh, vessel that is able to maintain the same environment uh, as whatever scale the discovery was made in, which will usually be in a couple of milliliters. So how do we ensure that product quality is maintained? How do we ensure that the cells produce the exact same product with the exact same properties? And, that, and not only that, but how can we make them produce even more so that we can uh, make our, uh, so we can optimize our process. So similarly, Let's assume now that this cell uh, secretes this uh, protein product, right? So it produces it within the cell and then uh, it spits it out essentially in its environment. So if we were working in a petri dish, what would we do? 
we would pipette out all the liquid, put it in a small centrifuge tube, use a benchtop centrifuge like the one shown here, um, and then separate our cells uh, from the supernatant, the liquid essentially, which will contain our protein, take that out with another pipette, job done. We have our protein, we've removed the cells, the product is there, we're okay. But how do you do that when you have a reactor that's 15,000 liters, right? So you need, you obviously can't do that at one milliliter Eppendorf tube. You need to design an appropriate piece of equipment that still separates the cells from your product uh, without damaging the product itself. Uh, and, and this is uh, the example for centrifugation. And there are multiple unit operations along the way uh, of uh, where biochemical engineers need to make this translation. How do I design an equivalent process that's able to operate at industrial scales? Uh, so uh, the general questions we need to answer are, if I have a particular product, how will I make it? How much can I make, given the constraints? How can I ensure that uh, product safety is uh, maintained and that I meet regulatory requirements? How much will it cost? And is the process commercially sustainable? Because maybe you have identified the best possible candidate molecule, but it's too expensive to produce, and you can never make a process that's financially sustainable. So it's a multidisciplinary uh, field, and it involves uh, a lot of the disciplines that are shown on the screen right now. Uh, I would say primarily uh, biology, uh, mathematics, and physics. Uh, engineering, as some people might refer to, but depending on which area you work in, you can branch more towards the business side of things or towards the medicine side of things. Uh, so so it's, it's quite diverse. Um, okay, so now let's speak about uh, studying at UCL. Um, so UCL, for those of you that are not from London or not from the UK, uh, is in the heart of London, quite literally. So. This orange uh, box drawn here is the central campus of UCL. Uh, and this map is, is, is a picture of central London. And I've just placed you know, a couple of the famous sites uh, around London uh, just to show you how central uh, UCL's location is. So it's a, really a very central part of London. Um, so UCL was founded in 1826, and it was the first university to admit students regardless of class, race, or religion. So essentially, back then, if you wanted to go to university, you had to be male, white, and from um, the upper class. And UCL was the first one to say, no, we, we will admit women and men and you know, people of any race, uh, irrespective of the background, just purely based on academic merit. Uh, it was the first university to offer systematic uh, teaching of medicine, law, and engineering, and 29 uh, alumni or staff from UCL have been awarded with the Nobel Prize. So today, uh, it maintains this ethos of you know, accepting everyone. It's a very diverse university. Our, our motto is we're London's global university. Uh, consistently, irrespective of which rankings you, rankings you choose to look at, because everything's slightly different, uh, consistently over the past say, 10 years, we've been ranked in the top 10. Uh, so uh, we have 36,000 students, including uh, 18,000 undergrads, the rest being postgrad, and our ratio between men and women is roughly 50-50. And students, our students come from 150 different countries, so indeed it is London's global university. So one of the benefits of joining such a big, big university as UCL is the fact that you get access uh, to a lot of uh, very uh, well-equipped facilities. So we've just, oh, I haven't had the time to update the slide because it will literally, this Monday, uh, we opened up a new student center, so that's an eight-story building. It's right next door to our department, which is essentially filled with study space, recreational space, and solely for the use of students. Uh, beyond that, we have uh, a very well-equipped library. Uh, uh, we have, and apart from the new student center, we have another two student hubs, which is essentially, again, study spaces, isolation spaces, where, you know, quiet spaces essentially for reading, uh, spaces you can book for uh, group work or project work, uh, but also spaces that you can book for social events. Uh, we, and these are all 
exclusive to students, with the ones marked as PG exclusive to postgraduate students, so only to master's students. Um, we have several computer cluster rooms around the campus, so you don't need to carry your laptop every day. You can just log in into one of the uh, computer cluster rooms and work. Uh, there, uh, we have a language center if you want to improve your English or learn another foreign language. Uh, we have a couple of museums and art collections on campus. They're, they're free to the uh, general public. And we have a great number of student clubs and societies that uh, are theme. Their themes vary anything from any sport imaginable to cultural, art, theater, politics, or literally anything they can imagine. Uh, and there is a gym. Uh, that is available for students, and again, it's located right next to the student center, so one minute walk from the department, very, very close. Um, now, uh, UCL has a dedicated department called uh, UCL Careers uh, that deals with career support uh, from the day you join UCL. Uh, so they can help you with one-to-one -one appointments, they can help you prepare your CV, uh, propose appropriate formats depending on the sector where you're trying to apply, uh, schedule mock interviews to get you ready for that big day where you have an interview with a company, uh, but also they can provide you more general information of how, can, you know, how would you go about finding a job depending on the sector you're looking for and so on. Also, they organize a number of career fairs throughout the year where a bunch of employers, either sector specific or general, uh, come at UCL, they each have their own stand and they sort of um, offer advice on recruitment, they have job postings that you can apply for and, and so on. Um, another important service is uh, UCL accommodation, so obviously if you're not familiar with London or any big city for that matter, finding a place to stay uh, can be a bit of a challenge, so UCL has a dedicated department uh, to help students uh, with their accommodation. And they offer uh, a wide range of uh, uh, college accommodation. Uh, so this range is anything from sharing your bedroom, having your own bathroom, not having your own bathroom, uh, catered, non-catered, where you have to cook and so on. So there's a wide range of available uh, halls of accommodation or halls of residence. Uh, the closest one being a five minute walk from campus, the furthest one away being maybe 20, 25 minute walk from campus. So, quite close uh, within uh, UCL. Uh, what's also very useful, and for the first couple of years I was at UCL, I was using this website, even though I wasn't a student, uh, is the new student support website. And this is really, if you're from outside the UK and it's going to be your first time living abroad, really your day-to-day, -day, how do I survive my first two weeks in the UK? Right? So how do I sort my visa? How do I you know, use public transport? How can I open a bank account? and so on and so forth. Uh, so lots of very useful information. Uh, but also we have the student center uh, where essentially students can uh, walk in and uh, sort of get any sort of support from uh, psychological support, if they're really stressed with a particular deadline or their exams, uh, to well-being uh, advice and, and so on. And the people working there are very enthusiastic uh, and, and they're very, very good at, at what they do. And finally, we have the student union, which is self-organized. It's organized by the student, as you notice down here where I have my links in the bottom right. Uh, they don't even uh, use a UCL domain. They're completely independent and they're responsible for all the societies and, and um, uh, events, uh, social events that happen uh, throughout the year. Um, so now let's talk a bit about the department uh, of biochemical engineering. So this is all of us. Uh, we're a small and friendly department, and that means, uh, you know, by the time the one year of the master has finished, you, you, uh, you'll get to know most of us on on a very personal basis. Uh, uh, so that creates a very nice, friendly, almost family-like environment. So the department itself was the first department in the UK to dedicate itself solely to biochemical engineering. Uh, and in the latest research uh, excellence uh, exercise, so essentially rating uh, the quality of the researchers, 90% uh, of our staff were rated either as world leading or internationally excellent. Um, but we place an equal focus on teaching with 
we have beyond our 20, 22 academic members of staff, we have another six members of staff uh, that are dedicated solely to teaching. Uh, and uh, we sort of have been pioneering the idea of integrating research into our everyday teaching, and, and we won the Queen's Anniversary Prize Award in 2013 for that. But we also sort of uh, place focus on enterprise, so we've We've had three successful spin-out companies from the department, from research done in the department. And I think late in 2018, so roughly maybe six months ago or so, one of these spin-out companies was, was bought out by GSK, uh, which is uh, GlaxoSmithKline, so quite a big uh, company. Um, now, one of the key... I'd say characteristics of the department is the fact that we work very closely with industry. So over 60% of our research projects are done in collaboration with industry. And these are just some of the companies. I couldn't fit everyone on one slide, but these are sort of some of the companies we have a very regular interaction with. Uh, so, uh, and we'll revisit this point in, in a couple of slides where uh, I'll go over how you can get to interact with the companies themselves and how you can benefit for from this close interaction we have with industry. So in general, our research spans three, let's say, application areas, so small molecules, biopharmaceuticals, and cell and gene therapies. And uh, in terms of development, we, we go all the way from genetic engineering, uh, so generating new modified strains, all the way to uh, process-wide optimization. So we do upstream, downstream, um, formulation, uh, and commercialization. So the entire spectrum of any area you could be involved with in, in terms of biochemical engineering. Just to give you an example how you can benefit from not only sort of the world-class labs that we have and, and the research we do uh, in terms of the research projects you could be associated with. So most of the research projects um, are essentially uh, linked, very closely linked to an ongoing research project we have in our labs. Um, so it's, most of them, as you will see here, are, are, are quite fascinating and they spawn from, you know, rewiring the genome of Pichia pastoris, which is a yeast, uh, to developing uh, automated microbioreactors on robotic stations and, and so on. So, so quite diverse, spanning the entire range of, of our activities. Just to give you an ex uh, a couple of examples of our research, so on the left-hand side, uh, can you see my pointer, my mouse pointer, or is it not visible on the screen? Probably not. Uh, but on the left-hand side, so on the left panel of, of, of this image, uh, you have cells growing, uh, and these are stem cells growing. And one of the uh, major challenges of uh, culturing stem cells is that in order to measure them, in order to count their concentration, you need to remove them from the reactor, uh, which means you are disrupting their environment. So our microfluidics uh, laboratory has developed this image recognition software that you can see operating on the right that recognizes the cells as they grow and is able to quantify them very, very accurately. Um, another example from our chromatography lab is um, the development of cellulose nanofibers in order to be able to uh, capture and purify adenovirus, which is a new promising sort of um, virus that's been identified with potential applications in drug delivery. So on to the MSc itself. Uh, I need to make uh, a disclaimer here. Um, so what I'm about to talk is the current structure of the MSc as uh, it's currently running. But from September 2019, 2020, so from the year that you are potentially interested in, there will be changes in the program structure. Um, fortunately, at least uh, until these changes have been officially signed off by uh, UCL, uh, we're not allowed to talk about them. So keep an eye on our website. Uh, the final documentation has gone in, so, so we should have the final approval within a week or two. Keep an eye out on our website. That will be updated immediately with a new structure. It is not a major change, uh, but I just thought that's why I have my disclaimers up there subject to change. Just that, so you're aware, what I'm going to describe will be slightly different to what actually occurs uh, next year. But the main principle still remains the fact that we split students based on their undergraduate background. 
Uh, so could you, could the people on the stream, uh, please type in the chat box their undergraduate degree, the title of their undergraduate degree. Medicine and bioengineer. Yeah. Oh, that's the same. Is there two of you or is it medicine bioengineering one degree? And pharmacy, okay. Uh, no was yeah. Oh, sorry, it was the previous question. Yeah, sorry, I had the chat closed. Okay. Um, so we have bioengineering and pharmacy. Okay. Um, so uh, in the case of pharmacy, uh, I mean, I would have to go through your transcripts in detail, but I guess the most appropriate stream for you would be the engineering stream, where you learn about the engineering fundamentals. So you have the life science or science background from your undergraduate degree, and you learn about the uh, engineering fundamentals. In uh, the case of bioengineering, again, I would need to have a look at the transcripts because bioengineering degrees from different places around the world are quite diverse. Um, so I'm not quite sure where it would fit in. I would have to look at the exact transcripts. It could be either engineering stream or biochemical engineering stream, okay? Uh, so let's go over the entry requirements. So we want a minimum of a second class uh, UK bachelor's degree or international equivalent. Entry onto our program is competitive. As a guideline, where you would want to be ideally is upper second class, so a 2 1 or above. Okay? Uh, uh, proof of English language proficiency if your native language is not English or if your first degree is not in English. Okay? Uh, your transcripts translated and uploaded. A personal statement explaining why you want to study biochemical engineering, what is your motivation, what do you find fascinating, uh, and two references from people that are able to comment on your academic abilities. So this would normally be your undergraduate tutor, and for example, if you did a research project, it could be a research project supervisor, or it could be another professor or lecturer um, where you got good grades in his course or something like that. The application deadline, oops, there's a slight typo there. Uh, the application of deadline is the 28th of July, 2019. Uh, particularly if you are not from the UK or Europe, so you need to have visa sorted out, I would recommend that you apply no later than May, 2019, because it takes some time for the visa to be sorted out. Uh, so let's talk a bit about the engineering stream. Again, as I said, subject to change, the engineering stream itself will not see major changes. So most of what you see here is accurate. A couple of the optional modules will change. Um, so the engineering stream really is about uh, building on your science or life science background uh, and sort of introducing all the core engineering concepts. So uh, by process synthesis and process mapping is all about how uh, you know, the various unit operations that we talked about early on, uh, how are they connected, what kind of equipment. So let's say fermentation is the straightforward part. I think everyone can imagine we have a bioreactor, we throw ourselves in with appropriate media, they grow, they produce something. How do we go from that, from whatever exits the bioreactor, into a pill or a vaccine? How do I purify? How do I separate? So there's a very, there's a, there's a series of processes and unit operations that you have to follow. And, and this module is all about learning about these processes. A bioreactor design, uh, again, how, what are the key concepts around how to go about designing uh, a reactor for industrial applications. Downstream processing, again, with a focus on uh, purification and separation, commercialization, uh, fluid flow and mixing, heat and mass transfer, again, how, uh, Essentially, as you transfer the material from one unit operation to the other, from the reactor, let's say, to a centrifuge, how do the flow conditions, how does the surrounding heat affect potentially the cells or the material that you're transferring? Uh, by process validation and quality <coughs> control, 
and a dissertation on bioprocess design. So the only the key thing I want to point out here for the engineering stream is that there is no research project at the end. Instead, you do a dissertation on bioprocess design. Now, in other places, so particularly in chemical engineering departments, this is known as a capstone design project. And this is where we ask you, we give you, uh, we put you in groups of four or five people and we give you a high level description of a process that you need to design from scratch. So let's say, you know, produce X amount per year of this particular drug using this particular cell line. So you have to go about and figure out what's the appropriate process, what type of reactor do you need, how big does that reactor need to be, uh, how many downstream steps do you need to have, how big these steps need to be, what are the costs associated, and so on. So really, really an early level design of the entire plant start to finish. And that is one of the primary requirements to have our degree accredited by the Institution for Chemical Engineering, which is the professional body responsible for the accreditation of our degrees. And that means that even if you don't have an engineering background, after you've successfully graduated with, uh, from our embassy, from the engineering stream, uh, you will become eligible to apply for chartered engineer status. Now, in particular, for the engineering stream, uh, you won't get um, chartered engineer immediately. Uh, you will need to work three to five years in an engineering-related position before you can apply for chartered engineer. But still, it sort of ticks all the boxes that would allow you to obtain chartered engineer, uh, which would not be available otherwise just with a degree in sciences or the life sciences. So skip through the science stream because neither of your background is suitable to the science stream. And I'll go to the biochemical engineering stream. Um, so uh, there is a bit more flexibility in terms of optional modules in the biochemical engineering stream. Uh, and the modules are sort of a combination of breadth in terms of application areas for biochemical engineering, such as uh, biorefineries, uh, cell therapies, industrial synthetic biology, uh, but also going a bit more in depth uh, with uh, modules such as bioprocess systems engineering. Uh, and, and, there is a, and there are several uh, optional modules to choose from, such as vaccines, microfluidics, uh, and uh, bioprocess management. But chemical engineering stream gets to do uh, a traditional research project at the end. Um, uh, okay, so to slowly start wrapping up, um, the unique elements of this one year uh, course are the following. Uh, you get access uh, and you get to participate in the modular training for the bioprocess industries or MBI program for short. What this is, is a a comprehensive program uh, of three, four day workshops uh, that have been designed uh, specifically to train scientists that work in the industry uh, into the latest development in focused thematic areas. So for example, we have an MBI on cell and gene therapies, we have an MBI on mammalian cell processing, we have an MBI on chromatography, we have a whole range of MBI modules. Uh, so essentially our industrial collaborators realized the need uh, to be able to continuously train and upskill their own employees with the latest development and that's the basis of how the MBI, MBI courses were designed. So uh, throughout the MSc I think you get to participate in three or four uh, MBI modules uh, and for the duration of those modules um, the person sitting next to you might be a person, someone working in industry. So uh, throughout the coffee breaks and lunch breaks and social uh, events of, of the MBI program, you get a very informal platform uh, where you can you know, ask them questions like, uh, how did you get your first job? Is your company looking for people? Or you know, what qualities is your company for looking in an applicant? And how should I go about applying and so on? So it's a very good informal platform to start gaining some inside information, but also slowly start building up your network of uh, your professional network. Uh, secondly, you'll get to do uh, hands-on practicals uh, in our laboratories. Uh, I'm not sure if the new website has images from our labs yet, or they're not there. They're not there yet. Uh, they will uh, go online eventually. 
Um, but essentially, I'd say 70% of the space of the entire building is dedicated to laboratories. Uh, we have state-of-the-art equipment, and it's equipment that you will actually use when you go and work in industry. It's not antiquated equipment from 30 years ago. Um, and it's really the, the practicals are designed as a way to connect whatever we teach in class uh, with uh, how things operate in, in real life in industry, essentially. Uh, one of the major features of the restructuring of the MSc is that we're changing the way we run practicals. Uh, so instead of running isolated practicals, you know, every Wednesday afternoon or whatever, we've bunched them up into week-long campaigns or, or that we call, you know, one is called pilot plant week uh, or, or scenarios. So essentially you get a week, an intensive week where you're every day in the lab and doing a bioprocess or a project from start to finish, from fermentation to chromatography. So you really get on the back of each unit operation of each particular individual step of the process. You get to you know work from the material you produce and go to the next step and go to the next step and get this nice continuity of what you know, an actual bioprocess would look like. And finally, uh, we have uh, a very strong team and very strong participation in the iGEM competition. Uh, it is run from the department. The, uh, the UCL iGEM team is run from the department. Uh, and if you don't know what iGEM is, it's a multidisciplinary competition in synthetic biology for graduate students around the world. So each university has a single team. It's completely student-led, uh, and the academics associated with that have more of the form of advisors. Uh, and we have a long tradition of, of winning gold. Okay, so some facts and figures for our graduates. Uh, typically, um, roughly half of our, uh, sorry, roughly a quarter of our graduates move on to do a research degree before they move into industry. Uh, so that shows how research intensive biochemical engineering is as a discipline. Uh, and I'd say roughly 54% of our graduates are employed in, in graduate jobs in pharmaceutics, uh, biotechnology companies, either in research and development or manufacturing positions. A smaller percentage goes on to work in biochemical engineering related consultancy. And being a university based in London, that is inevitably a part of our graduates that goes on to work in the financial and business sector. Uh, the average graduate starting salary, again, take this with a grain of salt. It varies a bit from year to year, depending on the state of the economy. But sort of the ballpark figure that we expect you uh, to get once you graduate is around £28,000 per year. Uh, just a highlight that this is not the only MSc we run as a department. We also run the MSc Biointegrated Design in collaboration with the Barthodon School of Architecture, also at UCL. And that's a two-year product focused more around how do you combine biological material with architectural and structural designs. And if you need more information about that, you'll find that on our website or you can contact uh, Dr. Brenda Parker, who is running that program. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them now. If something comes an hour later or a week later, my email is on the screen. Please send me an email. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. So thank you for your attention. Happy to get any questions you may have. Just type them in the chat box. So I'll obscure part of the screen so I can bring my chat box on. Uh, but try not to do any important. Research group. Yeah, so if you want to learn more about our research groups, uh, go onto our website and there's two ways of going about this. We have a section called research where you can get some sort of high level ideas of what the various areas we work in are. Uh, but also if you go under people, academic, and you click on individual profiles of our academics, you'll see a bit more detail uh, on uh, our particular areas of expertise, as well as a list 
of our most recent publications, which will give you a pretty good idea of you know what areas each of us is active in. To did that answer the question, or do we have any other questions? Okay. Uh, do we have the recording of a previous virtual open day with a Q&A session with the students? So usually the way we run this is we have students here and you can direct your questions to the students and they'll, you, know, you can ask how's the everyday life there, or how's the department, are the academic supportive and so on. Well, unfortunately, this week they're they're doing pilot plant week, so they're nine to five in their labs, and literally none of them is available. They have to be in the labs. So unfortunately, this time around we don't have anything. But I think on our website under virtual open days, you should be able to access a recording, the presentation with bit will be exactly what I said today. But you can go towards the end. It will be a Q and A session with students, uh, and you know, uh, I think it's an interesting segment because it's student to student questions. Um, I usually try not to speak at all and, you know, let the students give their own raw, genuine answer. Um, so, you know, that might be worth checking out. Um, do we have any other questions? I don't see any activity, so I'll take that as a no. There are no further questions. Uh, in any case, if anything comes up, my email is on the screen. Please send me an email. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for uh, attending our open day. I uh, hope to see you uh, and welcome you soon in London. Take care. Oh, sorry, there's one question. It's just okay. from Phil. OK, sorry. Phil just asked, um, the pharmacy is in the graduate degree and say, is that OK for um, biomedical engineering? I think his video was a bit glitchy when you were talking about that. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so to give you an exact answer, the best thing you can do is send me a list of all modules you have taken, uh, including the modules you're taking during this year, if any. So I don't need to see the grades for now. I just want a list of the module titles of all the modules you have taken up until now and all the remaining ones that you will take uh, by the end of your degree. Uh, we have had students with pharmacy degrees in the past, so yes, it is suitable, but because degrees from different universities and from different parts of the world are quite diverse, before I can give you a concrete answer, I, I need to have a look at the type of modules you have done. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, oh, wait, Phil is typing something. <coughs> Are you doing anything with BD by printing? Uh, so not in terms of our, of, of the educational part of the program. So there's no element of 3D bioprinting in the taught material or the practicals. Uh, in terms of, um, 3D by printing, yes, we have one or two academics that do research in that area. Is John, is that John? Uh, Brenda, okay. uh, and I think Nicholas with Kasim are doing something along those lines as well. Yeah, go and ask as many questions as you have. We're, we're not, I thought, yeah, we I was go. just about to say bye because I thought you didn't have any questions, but please, if you have questions, go on, now's the time. Um, so, you mean a reading list for the entire degree? So, no, we do not have a reading list for the entire degree. What we do have 
is individual modules will have their own reading lists. Um, now, if you are interested in, let's say, biochemical engineering 101 type of textbooks, just to get a better idea of what exactly biochemical engineering is, uh, please send me an email and I'll send you a couple of textbooks that I recommend, sort of entry-level textbooks.